What's more important to you? Exploring the idea that war is bad or, wow, cool robots? On today's episode of Systematic Geekology, as we cover our, through our primary political series, as we are the priests to the geeks going through this whole thing, we're going to be covering the Mobile Suit Gundam franchise from the very beginning all the way up to what's going on right now. Uh, I am so ready for this, but I could not possibly do this by myself. I had to have some friends, of course. You know him. You love him. He's better than all of us combined. It's TJ Blackwell. How are you doing, TJ? I'm doing great. Thank you for the introduction. Excellent. Always. And of course, a returning guest, someone who was very interested in this. We talked about it on Facebook before all this. Had to invite him on to have some fun. Uh, Matthew Winter, returning once again. How are you doing, Matthew? Good. Thanks for having me back. Absolutely. Uh, I'm looking forward to this one. We've got a lot to cover and only so much time and to do it all because we're the 20 plus series and anime and, and manga <laughs> and all this that are all over the place. Some of us have seen most of them. Some of them have seen a little less. We're just going to get through it. We're going to have fun. So guys, Gundam is what we're covering today. But before all that, what have you guys been geeking out on? I'll uh, I'll let Matt go first. I'll abstain for now. <laughs> okay. Uh, boring answer. So, um, just how my brain is with my ADHD and anxiety and whatever else. Um, like I like I go through bingey obsessive cycles. So, uh, still on the Dragon Ball kick from last time because uh, nice. I'm still waiting for Diamond to come out. So I'm just going through rewatching everything. I'm sitting down I'm sitting down with the kid, Jordan, he's seven. We're slowly crawling through Kai. He's seven. Nice. We get one or two episodes and then he's done. So <laughs> when I say a slow crawl, that's exactly what it is. But uh I I've been through Dragon Ball, through Kai. Uh, super, uh, and uh, I'm finishing up GT right now, as controversial as that is, but <laughs> uh, I'm also playing Dragon Ball Kakarot on my Switch. So even my oh, gaming nice. is so even my gaming is Dragon Ball right now. Like, I get super obsessive until I literally just want to puke and then I move to my next obsession until I can't stand that anymore. So... <laughs> Still Dragon Ball for me. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. We're 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 GT truthers here on systematic ecology. Uh, well, nice. well some some of you are. All of us. Every one of us loves Dragon Ball GT. All right. Yeah. Uh, mm. TJ, will you continue to dis disappoint me with what I think you're gonna say about what you've been geeking out on? There's a good reason. Okay. But, yeah, sure. Uh so the Valorant Champions Tour has just recently started. Kickoff was on the 15th of the month. Uh, it's been great so far. We've already seen some crazy upsets. Uh, but also Helldivers 2. Final answer. Okay. Great game. Now, uh, for everyone, th th well, that was just released, right? Mm -hmm. Just very recently. Okay. Very nice. Okay. Super now, fun. as for myself, uh, I have uh, started and am almost done with persona 3 reload i am currently on uh, well i was on the 222nd floor but then the power went off in my building so i lost all that progress so remember to say oh. it. <laughs> so I, i'm currently I, I didn't lose that much i'm still on the 219th but it's still the principle of the matter it's like i have to do that all over again but have, loving the game yeah i have quit playing games before when that happens oh I, I get it. They'll just I, they will just sit on my system and I won't beat them for like two years. Yeah. This yeah. Is... Repetition is the thing I hate the most in the world. That's why I, <laughs> I love kids, but I can't teach kids, you know? Because mm. they, they need that as part of growing up. That's not their fault. But I can't do that day after day. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's not quite the same, but uh, you know, I I love Dark Souls. Dark Souls two is my favorite one. Mm. I mm. had like 3,000 hours on one Dark Souls 2 account, and my Xbox's hard drive corrupted. Oh. oh. Gone. I haven't played it since. I don't blame you. I but on that dour note, <laughs> <laughs> let's go into, since we are in our primary political series, one of these special questions we're going to be asking is like, um, 
Does anyone here have a favorite political figure? Could be real life, could be fandom. Like, have at it. It's like, do you have someone like that's your favorite? That's just a wide net I just cast there. Teddy? Teddy what? Roosevelt? Teddy Roosevelt? Excellent choice. Mm-hmm. And Matt, do you need more time? Yeah, you know, I'm I'm fairly apolitical, so I'm thinking through my fandoms now and figuring out if there's any if there's a such thing as a cool politician even in fake worlds. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you some more time and I'll go with mine. Uh it's from my favorite anime of all time, Legend of the Galactic Heroes, Paul von Oberstein, who is kind of the epitome of your Machiavellian figure who is everything that I do is for the country. It's for my leader. And sometimes that's really good things. Sometimes it's very evil things. I mean, uh, you kind of not, it's not a one-to-one, but you kind of get like a more Rommel kind of feel from him. uh, For those of you who studied your history, but uh, I think a lot better overall as a character than Rommel ended up being in real life, but you know, that's its own thing. So yeah, Paul von Overstein, uh, the guy, if you want something to get done for the Empire and Legend of the Galactic Heroes, you go to him. You good to go, Matt? Matthew? Yeah, you know, this this isn't a real this isn't a real answer because I don't think I have one, but I'm just gonna go with Fair it. Enough. I'm gonna pick the dog man, president of the world from Dragon Ball. Because I think if a dog was a president of the world, things would be much better. I'd vote. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, much better than the two candidates we're going to get next year, or this year, I should say. (laughs) So, there's that. Uh, On to our main discussion. That is Mobile Suit Gundam. Not just the original anime, even though uh, I'm sure a lot of our conversation might tend towards the UC, the Universal Century. Uh, It's uh, definitely the most popular one out of every franchise from Gundam. Uh, So, we're going to touch almost all of them. I know at the end, I'm going to rate all of them. and That's not something everyone else has to do. Because have... <laughs> I've had the time to do such a thing. But uh, for all of us here, like Gundam as a show was developed in the 1970s, late 1970s. It came out in mm-hmm. 79, if I remember correctly, uh, under the guidance of Yoshi- Yoshiyuki Tomino, mm-hmm. who has kind of been like the main head for most of parts of Gundam, especially Universal Century, but as time Mm -hmm. went on, the different AUs, alternate universes, he stepped away for a little bit, let other people do it. The man has dealt a lot with uh, depression and anger and a lot of stuff like that that has kept him away from work and made him uh, put subpar work out there, read Victory Gundam, and then other stuff like that. Oh, we're going to fight there. (laughs) (laughs) And then uh, it's developed by Sunrise, who's uh, the anime mm-hmm. production company in charge of making it and, and drawing it and everything like that. That has uh, originally actually was canceled after, I believe, 43 episodes. But what brought it back is something that I will never once engage in my, in my life because I don't have the dexterity for it. And that is the Gunpla building, the the model robot building for the series uh, that came about that had a huge fan base for it. Uh, People were just going gaga over it, and then Sunrise smelled money. So they then brought and greenlit a sequel, Zeta Gundam. Your mileage may vary on that one. My mileage goes very down on that one. But I know other people really love it. So, And then time went on. Uh, Tomino kind of left, so we go to different AUs. We have G Gundam, Gundam Wing, After War Gundam X, so on and so forth. We get the Gundam Seed. Uh, the most recent, like most popular one that's come out more recently is Witch from Mercury. There are more plans out there to develop other things in the Thunderbolt kind of region of Gundam. And I think there's actually going to also be an anime kind of spinoff, I think maybe even prequel, for Iron Blooded Orphans that involves oh. Venus, if I remember correctly. So. I'm looking forward to that. I think it's called like Erder Hunt or something like that. But it's a massive franchise, one that obviously started was real popular in Japan. Then in the 90s, came to America. Most of the people who got into the fandom, chances are it's because of what happened with Gundam Wing being their introduction mm-hmm. to Gundam as a franchise. Then later on, we would get, they wanted to dub the originals. Uh, so we got dubs of Mobile Suit Gundam and Zeta. 
But then when the ratings kind of tanked, they didn't get to Devil's Ada, which is a travesty, but that's their loss because they're missing out on the best, not to spoil things for later on. <laughs> and we get to the point where we are today, where it has become way of a more massive fan base, not only in Japan, but also in America and really across the world, too. So, gentlemen, I, I think I probably know the answer, but what was everyone's introduction to the Gundam series? Wouldn't you like to know? Ah, uh, that's why I asked a question. Uh, Gundam Wing. It could be the, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Gundam Wing, I think. You know, it's, it's old. It, it's long enough ago for me that I, for some reason, I think that I had seen like some of the SD Gundam stuff first, because mm-hmm. that was around at the time too. They were doing the SD Gundam thing, but probably Gundam Wing, and I'm probably just confused. Yeah, uh, <laughs> for me, it's kind of, so they they reran Gundam Wing on Toonami when I was like eleven. And I didn't know that I I just was up, like woke up at night and Toonami was on. And apparently on that one day in 2012, they uh, played all of Gundam Wing. Nice. Who all knew? 52 Not me. episodes. Uh, right. Most of that's... it. Because that's they, they did a marathon. Mm. Okay. Yeah, uh, same thing. For a couple weeks. It was the the afternoon tsunami kind of block back in the mm-hmm. day. That started in the 90s, uh, would continue on in the 2000s until it kind of fizzled out for a bit and would become a part of Adult Swim uh, later on on Cartoon Network. Fell in love as a kid. It came out, I think, in, in the States at, in two, the, the year 2000. And I was at the ripe age to be ready for some real robot action. And I should specify before we go on, there's and tep- typically in your mecha genre, that is your giant robot series, there are super robots, which are a bit more bombastic. You'll have uh, you like your M- Mazinger Zs and stuff like that would be a bit more your super robot. They do the extra special super stuff. Yeah, your Gitter Robos, where you know they cause all this. Uh, Gurren Lagan would probably be the one most. Uh, American audiences would know the best is that it just does super fantastical feats that if you were thinking critically, no, that's not a thing, but because we're having fun, we allow it to happen on screen. Then, you know, your more real robots is kind of when what set Gundam apart from the things that came before. Like, even though there was, yeah, part of what happened in earlier mecha series, we would have things like uh, a Zambot 3, where it was a bit of a dis- deconstruction of it. Or we would have even a Mazinger Z, which is kind of like the precursor to a lot of all this, is like, you know, Koji, the head pilot, didn't understand how to pilot it immediately when he dropped into it. Like in most mecha series, you just kind of get it. So, but Gundam would kind of popularize, hey, these things need repairs. These things are limited by even with anime physics, there's only so much they're capable of doing. Mm-hmm. That's why you typically see them fight more in space because if they get on the earth, we have to create all bunches of things. Why the square cube law doesn't just break them apart the moment they enter the atmosphere. <laughs> so, you know, square cube law is fake. Thing. That's why. Yeah. I mean, and, and look, that, that was the thing that set Gundam apart when it came out is it really kind of deviated from the uh, Super Robot, which was the meta of mecha anime at the time. And really, I don't know if it invented, but it reinvented real mech. Because, uh, like, in you see, especially the older shows, are actually hard sci-fi with how all of the tech works and um, just super, even the way the colonies are designed was based on uh, the actual theories at the time. Yes. Which we see update in the 90s because we moved from the cylindrical colonies to the wheat to the wheels, which again yes. was the popular theory for how colonies would work in the 90s. So they're, they're trying to st- actually stick to real science rather than it being some fantastical, um, you know, super alien living robot like Mazinga or whatever else. Yes. And that's one of the important things too. For for those of you who played Halo, you kind of get the gist of what some of the colonies would later develop into, like design wise, is that giant circle in space where people would live. There's an atmosphere 
um it's a really cool thing and like earlier on in gundam like you did mention matthew is they would be a little more cylindrical more like cigar shaped compared to what we get but it was that adding that realism that kind of as you said, really set Gundam apart from what came before. That also in the fact that the the enemies were us. They weren't an alien race out to get us or a bunch of robots mm-hmm. or what have you. And it's certainly fun to be had there. Like, I've watched them all and I enjoy them all. But <laughs> there is something else to be said about a conflict between people that sets it apart from everything else. And that's one of the things you really got. Outside of Double Zero, there haven't Aliens don't exist in Gundam, and that was only in the movie. So it, it, yep. it is what it is, and I enjoy it immensely. But moving on from there, Love what is everyone's Zero. favorite? <laughs> Excellent choice. Mm. Does everyone have a favorite Gundam series? Ooh, um, whatever Gundam series I'm watching at the moment. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, Gosh. So I think as someone who had primarily seen uh, Wing and G Gundam um, when I um, and I'd seen I'd seen through, you know, OG. So Gundam 79 a couple times um, when when I decided, OK, there's so much more Gundam. I, I uh, you know, and I decided to just start watching through um, UC for whatever reason, I think, um, and I, we've discussed this and I know we have disagreement here, but I think for me, Zeta stood out as I was going through all of that because of the, because of the grittiness and just because of really the weight of what's happening. I feel it is more accurate to, war and destruction and PTSD and all of the things that go along with war. Um, and I think it's just does what it's supposed to do better than other shows. Yeah. Uh, Gundam, I, I do feel like is at its best either when it's gritty and real or when it's so out there that you just <laughs> can't believe it. But my favorite is Iron Blooded Orphans. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I'm just What's I'm a it? young guy. I, I feel like it was it was the first Gundam series that I really gave its own chance. Like Wing Wing V, I just kind of happened to be watching and then wanted to finish it because I was annoyed that I saw episode like six through eleven first, and then <laughs> like had to go back and watch. Uh, Fair. So Iron Blooded Orphans came out. I was on Hulu kind of a lot at the time, watching Futurama reruns, and I was like, oh man, I should this looks good. I should watch this. And I, I did, and I really like it a lot. Uh so hmm. yeah, my my uh for IBO, uh, which I do really love, my introduction to that series was me incorrectly pressing the right episode on hulu instead of the first episode i clicked on episode 18 because that was the most current one at the time so that was my introduction to the show and i'm like okay man i'm captivated but i have no clue who these people are well (laughs) obviously because they were set up way earlier (laughs) so yeah uh but for me like as the antithesis to everything that zeta stands for and i say this with all respect to my dear friend here (laughs) double zeta is my favorite even though it, it's beginning, the, the, the mood whiplash you get from the ending of Zeta to the beginning of Z- Double Zeta is something that, like, you get slapped in the face, and I don't blame anyone who gets upset at that. It takes a bit to get its own footing to find out what it is, but it gives hope back to the series. It gives a way for, hey, we suffered through all this here. There's a chance we can still fight this and stop, you know, Zeon from taking over the galaxy again and... Uh, all these rogue renegade earth forces as well i love it judo is my guy like uh, he doesn't take crap from anyone he's his own man and as opposed to camille and that's let's say camille is a bad character it's like i, I gravitate towards one over the other mm-hmm. so that's me for double zeta and i was in charge of the images so i get to choose that one that's what we show on the screen <laughs> yeah that's my fault. I could have wrested that from him. Good have. 
The story. Hey guys, have anything story, else? Story wise, yeah, I mean, I agree with you. It definitely gets good at some point. Last half of the show is brilliant. Um, the double Zeta itself, to me, kind of starts to break real mech. So I, I kind of feel like double Zeta was where we started to see the shift towards less realistic mech design. That's totally fair. So nope. I hold that against it also. Yeah, I'm a huge fan <laughs> of unrealistic mech, personally. Why, why, why realistic huh? mech? We can build that. We can try, at hey, least, yep. you know? I think that's why. So, you know, like, like in, in, yeah. in my head canon, if we can have these things. Yeah, Whereas, like, if, that's very if, fair. If they get too fantastical, we cannot have these things. <laughs> fair. Yeah, I, I see it like a like a really cool Hot Wheels. You know, mm. like, man, I wish that existed. When realistic Gundams are real, we're going to look at the less realistic ones and be like, man, I wish that was real. <laughs> so if you're listening out there right now, you're watching this video on YouTube, like, and you're wondering, okay, well, and you know nothing about Gundam as a whole. Like, why would we include this as part of a political series that we're doing to explore the pl- politics of the different <laughs> fandoms like we've done for Star Wars and even more? Well, let me help you out here. <laughs> so why would we choose that for politics? Because it shows up in almost every single one. Now, obviously, Universal Century is where it comes in the most. Mm-hmm. But guys, like, how does it come up in the many varied stories that we see? Just in general, there are plenty to choose from. I want to hear what you have to say. Uh, I feel like what we're missing a lot here, that's a good image, uh, is Gundam military. Flat out. Like, that's... I. There are a couple of series where non-military entities have Gundams. But by and large, these are just tanks. Yeah. So... It's pretty much a war or squashing a rebellion or seizing yeah. land or imperialism, child soldiers, child slavery, poverty, regular slavery. Uh, you know, racism, classism, all that, you know, all that's in there too. You know, yeah. I mean, it's all, you, you, it's actually like we're distracted by the shiny robots and do explosions, but like that's actually the stuff. At least in the uh, the in the UC continuity, that's actually what the story is about. Is um, the expansion of mankind into space and imperialism and colonies wanting freedom and just the even the interplay between governments and militaries and military coups and you know special ops takes takeovers and all of this stuff that feed the plot line through the universal century um and yes the gundams and the really mobile suits as a whole are the vehicles of war but the actual emphasis storyline wise is all the stuff behind the wars. The people, the people that are inside the cockpit, their commanders, the militaries and the governments they serve. Yeah. yeah. yeah completely agree. Did you have something you want to say, TJ? No, just uh, even oh, I've only seen a few Gundam series. I'm by far the least experienced member of the panel. However, I, I, there's barely an episode that I've seen that isn't at least a little political. And if not yes. big political, then small political, like school political. Mm-hmm. But like military school political, so it's still... Mm-hmm. Yeah, it comes in different forms. That's the great thing about the AUs in Gundam is we can have the original you know, UC where we see like this big conflict between the Earth Federation that has acclaimed all these colonies across our solar system here. 
yeah, that solar system, galaxy, different one, solar system. Sorry, I had to yep. science myself for a second there. And yep, because we have Jupiter um, colony, we talk about, we never get to see it. Yeah. But... And Jupiter actually does focus in later on the UC for Victory Gundam. Mm -hmm. um, then we have in uh, as the calendar for the universal history kind of changes. We have a conflict between Earth and Xeon. Xeon being a breakaway faction from one of these space colonies that decides, hey, Earth doesn't care about us anymore. You see us as less than. You send a lot of political prisoners here. So we're going to go like Space Australia, and then we're going to nuke Space Australia with a colony. Yeah, actual Australia, I should say. And that sets off an entire war. You get sides of like Earth Federation trying to control what they think is already there. Zeon trying to fight for their own freedom. Like, who is in the right here? Is anyone in the right? Should we be cheering for anyone? And then you get the whole conflict as new types start appearing. It's like, is this what humanity's natural progression and evolution as we head towards the stars? So that's you see for the most part. Uh, you get to stuff like uh, After War Gundam X is kind of a si serious thing there as well. Similar is what I meant to say. But in this case, Earth actually lost the war uh, that we see in Mobile Suit Gundam. And then how does that work with Earth being te technologically not as advanced as the people in colonies? Are they afraid of us? How are they going to fight it with the skin? Uh, then Turn A Gundam, kind of a similar thing in that respect. If like Earth is at the point of like 19th, 20th century technology, after you find along the way, uh, another war is broken out. It's a very cyclical thing. Kind of one of the themes of turn A is that we keep going into space, we keep fighting with one another, then civilization kind of gets wiped out for a bit. We get back into space, we recoup our losses, it happens again, re rinse, repeat, and how like that can cause for people who were away from that on the moon, who had their own colony there, how they are very technologically superior to us, yet how could we fight against them? You've got uh, Wing, where... <laughs> Uh, it's another flip on the typical thing where our space colonies are actually the protagonists here, and they send out the five Gundams to attack Earth as you know revenge for everything they've suffered there. But it gets into a lot of political machinations of who's behind what. Like, should we trust Trey? Should we trust Oz? Like, right. are, are the are the Gundam protagonists actually our good guys in this scenario, or have they been fed a lot of lies? Then we get. I try not to go through all of them, but just uh, I'll do one more. IBO. We get. Earth colonizing Mars, seeing them as second-class citizens, and then uh, getting the child slavery, child soldiers in that extent of, hey, you're only good to uh, for us if you get these jobs done. You are literally like uh, space debris is kind of one of the terms they use in there. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. that's just how unimportant you are. Your lives don't matter. Well, what if we think our lives matter? <laughs> and then you fight against the system in that respect. So once again, there's this other gun series I could go through, but for the sake of time and not being the only person speaking, I will move on from that, unless you guys have something else you want to say. Now, I was going to say, uh, you have double O. It's less, but it's still, like, it's there even, too. Because you've got, rather than a unified Earth, you do have an Earth that has several factions. Um, we don't have colonies. We have, like, a solar what production array or whatever that's in orbit where people live in orbit. The elevators? Yeah, the elevators. Yeah. Um, but um, that is, you know, we're using Gundams to basically try and enforce peace. Celestial being yes. is. Um, because, as we mentioned earlier, there are aliens coming. And we, and, and we need a unified mankind to fight the aliens. Yes. It's the only, it's kind of the only uh, mobile suit series where we see aliens and we see the Gundams really be kind of a extra military force they're their own thing but even in that there's so much political turmoil on earth that w we still have that political um aspect it just it doesn't drive the action as much mm -hmm. hmm. well said so kind of mentioned it a little earlier through the descriptions of the different series but in most continuities, not all, but in most, you kind of have at least two sides fighting a war against one another. We kind of start in media rests um, in the midst of that conflict, and neither one of them really seem much better than the other once you actually get into the meat and potatoes of it. Like, how do we feel that this is handled in the series, and is there anything we change about it? No, I think it's great. I think that's the best part of most, I would say, competent fiction that it 
is, is trying to make you realize like the duality of man is that uh, you actually can tell that like both sides believe in what they're fighting for. Neither side is completely unreasonable usually. Uh, but I think Gun does that really well. Sometimes. Sometimes there's just one side is definitely on the right side. That's my favorite part. Um, in in UC especially, uh, you know, uh, yeah, uh, you know, Zeon did some really bad stuff and uh, we kind of get, you know, we kind of get um, Space Hitler with, um, you know, <laughs> but um, at the same time, uh, you know, we see, we see what happens after the one year war. Um, you know, we see Stardust Memory, the Titans get formed. Um, and really, military t- the military takes over the government, and like the Titans are not good people. Um, you know, in Zeta, we learned that um, Amaro was basically in house arrest because us angry Earthnoids were scared of new types and what uh, what they stood for. Um, so then who are the good guys? And I really like that because I feel like in real life, especially in war and in politics and things like that, there are no good guys. You're out there killing other humans. You're not the good guys. That's just... From a moral perspective, in war, everybody loses. And I think that Gundam portrays that really well. Um, There are some other decent, like, war anime, but I still think from that humanity perspective that, um, you know, there's honorable... There's honorable bad guys. Uh, you know, we think of you, you can think about you can think about someone like Ramba Rall in mm-hmm. um, um, the One Year War era. Like he's he's a dude. He's on the wrong side, so to speak. But like he's one of the best. Like as a dude, like he's one of the best guys in the whole from a character perspective um, in the whole franchise. Um. He just happens to be from Zeon. Um, and then then you've got uh, you've got guys who are on you know the good side, quote unquote, and, and they're terrible. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, well put. It it's one of those things that done poorly. This could be one of those things I roll my eyes and move on with my life. And uh, I think it happens every now and then in Gundam where it's like, okay, well, obviously both sides are evil. Humanity is bad and blah, blah, blah. And then I just check out other times you do it well. And I see all the intricacies. I see members of like Ramba Rall inside of Zeon who are fighting for that goal. Their original goal was to be acknowledged as people who were worthy of life, who were worthy mm. of being respected and then to have that cause co-opted by people like uh, the Zabi family, who uh, in Zeon, the backstory there is that Zeon Zaidaikum, I think is his last name, yes. is um, uh, starting a political revolution to make sure the people in the colonies are treated and respected as people as he's developing his own philosophy. It's like, I think humanity is kind of changing as we reach the stars. And there's the allegations of whether or not he was assassinated by the Zabi family. Um which in I think cut material, I think one point in time, uh, Dozel actually apologizes to Sela and says, Yeah, we were responsible for that. But since that's not canon, I don't know if that's still true. But it's still isn't like that hey, in, we, we isn't had... that in origin or was it cut? Oh, th- was that in origin? I-, I can't remember if they did that in origin or not. Because I know when originally if done it a- an excellent show. Uh if they had continued to think 50 some episodes they were supposed to do. It would have been in there, but they got cut because they got canceled. Mm-hmm. I know that much, yeah. yep. uh, but you, you had the ideas. Like, oh, this is a good thing. Like, Hey, like just cause we send people to all space, Australia, that doesn't mean they're all criminals <laughs> and convicts and you know, they're less worthy of life than us over here on the earth. We're just so much better than them. But at the same time, you have people on the earth who are letting that happen. But then you also have good men like general revel, who's like, hey, like, 
I'm here to do a job. I'm here to protect people. You guys have literally sent space colonies that have decimated the world. Uh, I cannot have that happen. Let's fight against this. And you have uh, Captain Bright, who is a kid who is trying to act like an adult because he's been forced into this impossible situation to where he's got to get all these civilians and people who have no military experience whatsoever away from being destroyed in a colony where they were illegally making Gundam, so it makes them a target of war. Yeah, that never would have happened if they weren't doing this illegal thing. It, it's a good thing that it, adding that complexity into the situation mm -hmm. makes you go, okay, well, maybe I'm not. It's not easy for me to pick a side, but I know personally who I'm on the side of. Like, I can kind of get a little behind Shara's like uh, revenge scheme against the zombies, but like I'm still on Amuro's side at the end of the day because right. he's not going to shoot anyone in the back just because it'll get him closer to his goal. Right. Uh, you were mentioning, you know, Bright Noah, and man, there's maybe more than anybody, there's, man, you know, talk about well-done character development. <laughs> because yes. he's, he's a Federation soldier, uh, but but then you you see him leading the anti Earth Union group in Zeta to fight for the uh, freedom of the colonies from a unified Earth government, um, and it's like he's actually fighting against the Titans, which were the special forces that were to uh, were created to keep Zeon from reforming, um, and then he goes on to basically be all basically the hero in unicorn he just walks in and he just knocks out the, like the general guy what yeah. we're doing is wrong i won't be part of this like he gets get kicked out of the military all that stuff knocks out the general and that was um and that's all over laplace's box cuz the government had been hiding the original charter for the colonies um, where space noids are supposed to be equal partners in earth government. Oh yes. Yeah. Now, uh, TJ, let's go to IPO for a second. Give you a little more to talk about there. Cause we, we have, we have Gall Gallahorn, we have Tekadon, we have Tewaz, we have uh, whatever Russell Elian is associated with. Like go through that a little bit. Yeah. So as a series, Iron Blooded Orphans is, is it kind of starts as a revenge story, you know, child soldiers breaking free from what is, what is basically captivity, being forced to fight a war they don't believe in, uh, starting their own security company, trying to give back to their people on Mars and taking the fight back to the government. And then things get a little messy. Uh, you know, they are children. Uh, they don't make such great decisions sometimes. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's just the way it is. Uh, there, there are children in charge of very powerful machines of war. You know? Yeah. And go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> yeah. As time goes on in this series, it... it in my opinion, it kind of dips at the end. I don't believe it's a very earned. That's uh, not, not a downer ending. It's a bit more bittersweet. I, I think it could have been better. But you get to this point of our, our main group, Tekadon, is kind of you know, fighting against the machine. They're the ones that no one saw any value in, but they're proving they're capable of doing so, making sure that all there are reforms that need to be done, uh, keeping Kudelia alive so that she can uh, make diplomatic exchanges between earth and mars where they're treated as people only to get stabbed in the back in the end and just kind of all pretty much i mean spoilers for a lot of these series but spoilers for ibo uh, basically no one survives outside of a select few and that was kind of things that kind of lost me towards the end of ibo i still love the series it's still one of my highly rated ones but i definitely think they went too far in one direction of making sides unlikable besides our main people so I don't know what you guys think about that. Yeah, I, I kind of like it. It's I feel like possibly the least 
I don't know how to say what I'm trying to say. Uh, it doesn't require a lot of commitment to enjoy. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have mm -hmm. to, you don't have to be in it to be in it. <clears throat> like I know who I'm supposed to like here. Okay. It doesn't play on your own moral compass much. Yeah. Uh, I, IBO's definitely... Uh, it's not entirely clear-cut, but for a Gundam show, it's quite clear-cut, like, who to root for. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I like that. Yeah, that's about it, totally fair. Yeah. It's not like... Yeah. Uh, to use a different example, Hunter Hunter. We're like, oh... Our main characters, bad guy, horrible people. Don't root for them. The Chimera ants are just trying to live. Surprise. That's enough for me. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. You guys have anything else you want to add before we head on? I will say that that is the advantage of uh, most of the alternate timelines is there, uh, you know, Seed being the exception, because it there's quite a bit of world building there now. But um, for the most part, it's a standalone show. You don't need the investment of understanding the political structures and what's come before and what's happening next. It is a self-contained snapshot of a story in one, you know, usually 52 episode anime. And that's it. The characters that you have or the characters that you have, the, um, the good guys and the bad guys are usually more clear. Not ex uh, eh, you know, Less with Wing. I'm still not really sure who the good guys are there. But <laughs> for the most part, they're easier to digest than jumping into the UC because you need to understand the whole timeline. Yeah. Uh, and it, I, I have to feel like it also benefits Gundam to be so large. I know it's a fallacy to think that, like you're so large that you can't fail, but I genuinely think that Gundam could produce any series, whatever they want. And then as long as they don't do it again, they'll be fine. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Well, one of the things that kind of gets started in OG Mobile Suit Gundam and becomes adapted in different ways. You have the X-Rounders in Age. You had the Coordinators in Seed. And so on and so forth. It is that humanity's exploration of space, we touched on this before, has changed us as a species fundamentally to the point that even people who aren't out in space have started developing these new type abilities. They mm -hmm. possess these enhanced um, psychic connections to uh, space, reality, people, uh, some people are capable of telekinesis. Some it just makes them pilot a mobile suit better. That also leads to creation of psycho new types, which kind of like artificially created uh. new types as we get into Zeta and double Zeta and so on and so forth. Like, uh, how do we feel about how this new type idea is portrayed in the series? And do we agree with the premise that this will happen when we populate the stars? Like it, yes. So I think... Um, I didn't get it when I first watched um, 79, and that is because of how they had to shorten. But with, if that is you not your fault. No, if but if you watch the movies, which is actually for the for that particular content, my favorite form, rather than watching the what 47 or 43 episodes of the show, three. 43 yeah. episodes of the show. If you watch the three movies. They changed some dialogue where then like the new type stuff makes more sense mm -hmm. because, because I had watched, so I had watched 79. Um, I, you know, it's like the, the last seven episodes, suddenly they're talking about like new types and all that stuff. It just like gets, gets dropped on you. Um, like gets dropped on you with the whole Shah or Lalo relationship just out of nowhere. Uh huh. Like, like I agree. Up to, like up to that point, they were normal people, uh, but and suddenly, um, but uh, then to go and watch Zeta, and Zeta is all about that to the point where they're where the 
military is trying to artificially create new types with cyber new types and all that stuff. And I'm like, okay. But then um, my brother showed me the uh, the Gundam movies. And I'm like, okay. This makes a lot more sense. Because they... Just in a couple scenes. Like, they didn't rewrite very much. But they just added some dialogue about what new types are and all that stuff. And I'm like, okay. Now I get it. But... It seems to change throughout the show because once you get like into the second century of UC, we kind of don't have, we don't, we don't have powers anymore. Um, We've got, I mean, kind of like at the end of F91, Seabook is able to like, feel her and like find her with like abilities or whatever but like up to that point they're like oh new types are good with machinery it was just this like you're you're oh i'm good with technology i'm a new type yeah so they even seem to um you know post post all the big wars so i guess post zeon post neo zeon um, post post the sleeves, all that stuff. We get past that, and uh, it's it's like humanity as a whole almost forgot what these things are. Yeah. I, I, or <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry, you froze for a second there. Yeah, I was just saying. What I, were you I, saying? I, I was just saying. I, I don't know if it's bad writing or if it be. <laughs> or it's because it is more normal and they start to forget that people weren't always like that. Within a couple generations of there being new types, um, you know, they forget that, uh, hey, there's old types out there still that aren't like this. And so they actually lose sight of what it is about new types that makes them new. As it yeah. becomes yeah, more norm, as it becomes more normal for humans to live in space. Go ahead, TJ. No, no, I like it a lot. Uh, it reminds me, and to me, that says that uh, it inspired uh, one of my favorite short stories that you had to read. Uh, yes. No, yeah, All Tomorrows by C.M. Kosnan where oh. humans move to space and then start to change because they're in space now. It's different. But I'm I'm a fan of the idea at the, at the very least. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, it's Honestly. one of those things that it, it is so abrupt <laughs> in the original series that there are very small clues, and I mean like microscopic. You're looking at it with a microscope with the intent of seeing it. Clues that right. there's a, something a little more to Amaro. There's something a little more to Char that makes them different than other mecha pilots. Says, and then when eventually when we see Lala and Char's relationship and how she connects to Amaro, that's when we really start ramping up. Oh yeah, new types are a thing, and that's what we're all about. That's what we've always been about. And <laughs> it, it's it, it's ridiculous looking at it that way. I agree. The movies are a lot better way to see like this being developed a lot better. Um. But it makes sense from you know the sci-fi kind of point of view. Is like we really don't know how we as a species are going to handle living in space for extended periods of time. Um, that's not we're still even not even out of our own you know solar system at this point in time too. Like how could that change us? Like just moving uh, where gravity doesn't affect us the same way, or we're constantly being pulled around in ways we're not used to on the Earth. Like, how does that change us as a species? I find that fascinating. And I agree as well. It's like they kind of lose their way. After Double Zeta, you get to F-91, you get to Victory Gundam, and it's like, oh, yeah, we used to have a lot of those around, and then it kind of just petered off. But also they exist again, guys. It's cool. And I think that's just not writing as tightly as they should have. It's like, hey, we should have had someone uh, on the Shrike team or what have you who was a new type, or maybe there is, it's been a while since I've seen victory and it's the pre-established thing. And we're also still using cyber new types. Uh, I think I said psycho 
erroneously earlier they they, they turn psychotic <laughs> as a result well, of the cyber so medics. there's the psycho gundam that's that thank you piloted by a that makes a lot of sense yes so i think you just um, combine those there you go and we you get know, our good old exactly new types four. here yeah four um who is Unfortunately, someone I really wanted to live, but Tomine just had to be in one of his depressive states at that point in time, and we lost her. Uh, I prefer and her Zeta, over Zeta. Like Every- Zeta and Victory both, like they're like Game of Thrones level of people just dying. <laughs> it's brutal. Uh, <laughs> I would say Zeta, Zeta, it has earned more than Victory a thousand times more. Yeah. Um, but it, it's that idea. It's like, oh. What does this mean for humanity? If we were to suddenly change, this isn't like a racial thing. This uh, we've had problems with that in the past, but this is a new way of exploring those concepts. Like mm-hmm. it's the whole humans versus mutants in Marvel comics. Yeah, it's like, hey, you guys are different. You are doing things that scare me. I don't shoot lasers out of my eyes. I can't control someone's mind with my brain, but you can. It's like. Uh, how do I wrestle with that? Do I just trust you implicitly? Do I put things and make sure you can't abuse those abilities? Like, would it be evil of me to prevent you from using what something that has, God has allowed you to develop as part of, mm-hmm. you know, evolving throughout this uh, uh, bit of time here? Like, I-, I love exploring those things, and Gundam for the most part does that fairly well. Yeah, and yeah, you get absolutely. you get into other s- series. You get the, the innovates of uh, Double O. Um, and then how they're kind of artificially created as well for the most part. It's like, how does that tie us to humanity um, and all this? It's a lot of fun. I I don't think that's gonna, what's going to happen when we go to space, but it's really cool to think so. Yeah, you know, the innovators are almost more of like a, like a singularity type um, rather than um, like an actual evolution. Hmm. Yeah, I really... They're, because they're tied in with um, what's the name of the computer on the moon? Um, uh, Veda. Yeah, they're all they're all tied in. I don't, I don't know. They don't really say if it's technological or psychic or what, but the innovators are tied in. They're tied in with this supercomputer on the moon. So that, ahead, that's a lot more technical than kind of other new typey type. Um, and then. It's not even really a part of the plot at all in Wing, although you kind of <laughs> want you you kind of wonder about a few of the characters just the way they are. Um, Catra especially, I wonder if there's like new typey stuff there, but it's not. I, it's not in dialogue. It's not in the plot. Yeah, I, I think at early drafts they were going to make. I want to say you you Fei or Wu Fei mm-hmm. into one. But mm-hmm. I think that was like early, early drafts, and they kind of just ditched the whole new type thing at one point in time. TJ, it's something you wanted to say. Yeah, I mean, I think realistically, humanity is either going to get taller, lankier, and less strong, or the exact opposite. Uh, oh, in in less gravity. Yeah. 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 Or the opposite, and become more dense. Mm. To try and counteract or that, both. I don't know. Or 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 maybe both, and then we yeah. get you know we get we get diver- get diversity there, even get subspecies that diverse adapt differently in space. Yeah, uh, I think it definitely. Do I depends. think that we'll get like tell us like telekinetic and psychic abilities? Yeah, uh, not from that. Maybe, well, so but not from that. I so I get the idea behind it because. Like even now, there are you know there are stories where a spouse just knows their spouse has died, or no, they're not dead. They like whatever they get reports that they're dead. They're like, no, they're missing. They're still alive. You know, five years later, they find their spouse, and that that's because like there is something when you have that kind of intimate connection with somebody where there is a connection. That is beyond, you know, physical, hormonal, whatever. There's a soul connection where you just, you're aware of the other person's existence. And so as we, this is the idea behind new types. As we move into space 
and families are further and further away from each other because you have families of origins on, on the earth, but you have your cousins and your nephews and your grandkids or whatever out in space, our ability to have that connection gets stronger to, to um, reach across the vastness of space. So um, it, it's just this ability to have that same kind of soul connection, so to speak, but across space. But like when you get into Camille being able to like absorb people's souls and use it to turn the Zeta Super Saiyan, that that just doesn't you know that doesn't make any sense. You don't think? But <laughs> yeah, and we have you know Judo and Haman both like having a, a pretty much a Super Saiyan battle as well between their two auras at one point in time. It's it's a lot of fun, but I, I'm with you there. I don't think it's going to be a thing. It'd be the cool in, if it was. The initial concept makes sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I, I think, think that our ability to just be connected to friends and families on that psychic, emotional, spiritual level is something that does exist. And for that to just grow stronger because of the distance that's required to be connected to someone through space. Yeah. I can see that being amplified into more um, psychic, empathic type abilities. Yeah, I, I feel like what might have happened was uh, they came up with the concept for new types, and then someone read a like a Fantastic Four comic and was like, "What about them <laughs> going to space? To give them superpowers? Why don't Why don't new types have superpowers?" <laughs> Just get hit by cosmic rays. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, unless anyone else has anything you want to say on this, I'll move ahead. Okay. So, one of the, the smaller kind of themes that kind of shows up every now and then, it shows up in Witch for Mercury, it shows up in o and UC, I almost said OC, uh, Gundam as well, is like the suffering of soldiers and civilians alike in the midst of war because... There are businesses out there like Anaheim Electronics, like the Pell and Jet Turks, who are uh, profiteering off of selling weapons to other people in the midst of war, in the midst of preparing for conflicts. Like, and like, I have a question for you, just not necessarily about Gundam, but like, is it inherently wrong to be a war profiteer, or do they serve a purpose in the world? I mean, like, uh, just for example, uh, we have the Russia-Ukraine war right now. It's like, is it ethical for someone to be selling weapons to either side? Are you mm. asking me? Yes. Ethical? No. <laughs> okay. Profitable? Extremely. Uh, so, I don't know. From a business, like from a business and like a workplace perspective, um, I like it if. As as a business, if your business is going to be involved in a war, I think uh, actually selling to both sides is the best way to stay neutral. Yeah, because then you're not you're not on okay. one side. Or, you're not on one side or the other. You're giving you're giving both sides access to your resources. You are being fair, fair and neutral. Yeah. Um, uh now, but. Is war a good thing to begin with? And oh, is, uh, is, 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 is war something that we should be involved in in the first place? Yeah. So that, that, we have to I answer like... that question. I have to answer that question before we can say, well, should we be selling weapons to both sides? Should we be selling weapons at all? Yeah. <laughs> I think the most right, ethical okay. thing is to not be in a war. Mm -hmm. uh, and to not involve yourself by facilitating said war. Mm -hmm. but if, so there's but no if just cause for to, war in your opinion. But if you are going to, you might then as well. play both, both sides so that you're neutral. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so am I hearing that there's no just cause for war? Uh, I wrestled yeah. with that. I, Tell I, Augustine I to see me. I, I wrestle with that a lot. Cause yes. I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, gen I'm generally an Augustine fan. 
So I, I can't just go, well, he was, you know, but, uh, and just growing up in America and, and the culture that we have, this idea of just war and, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the idea that, you know, um, the only way that evil wins is when good men do nothing or the, the, whatever the Churchill quote is something similar to that. Um, so just growing up with that as my meta, it's, I have to wrestle with that. Um, you know, part of me definitely says no, no, no war, no killing, whatever. We're literally like extinguishing a life that God created. Mm-hmm. A, another person who who is a unique created imager of God. Like, who are we to have the right to end that? Because we didn't make it in the first place. But and obviously, we're, go ahead, go ahead. You know, but then when you have when you have a Hitler out there who's killing millions and millions and millions of people, do you just let that go unchecked under the guise of peace or pacifism or whatever? Or do you stop it so that less people die? Like these are these are tough questions that I don't think we're ever going to have answers to. We're going to have to wrestle with it as long as humanity continues to exist in this plane of existence. And uh, so obviously in the span of this conversation, we're not going to solve that question, but I want to bring it as part of the series that we're covering here. It's part of the politics they have to develop. And as someone uh, I'm, I'm not nearly as jingoistic as I used to be when I was 18 years old. I'll put it that way. (laughs) But I still favor direct intervention. Like mm. I was angry as uh, the Iraq war was starting up that our reason for going was the the weapons of mass destruction. Like, sure, yeah, that's a reason, but there's also people suffering under a dictator. Like that that is my reason for going there and hopefully having competent people, which we obviously didn't have, to start a new government introduce democracy to the area, cause as few problems as possible. And a uh, Knowing I live in a world where there is no such thing as peace in a world that <laughs> has none of it, but we right. still seek after it. So, and that's easy for me to say, but I'm also not the person who had to make that order. I'm not the person responsible for the lives of soldiers on our side who lost and the soldiers on their side who lost. And I'm also, as someone who kind of believes in a stricter doctrine on hell, I recognize that certain people who are dying in that conflict, in as how I interpret scripture, aren't making it to where I want them to be. And by making that decision, uh, you could argue, I would argue no, that I'm the one who brought them there. I would argue ultimately it was them making their own decisions, but still I am a factor in how they weren't able to continue living their lives. That's something that I need to wrestle with. That's something I need to think about. So for me, like, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say, I'm going to not pull that thread because we'll be here for like another hour. So I'm just going to let that sit. (laughs) So so for me, when it comes to the topic of war profiteering, Mm -hmm. I I like the neutrality you're trying to send out. But as (laughs) me, as someone who thinks a little more black and white than the world wants me to, I'm selling to Ukraine in this conflict. I see what's happening with Putin being in charge. I'm not acting like Zelensky is some paragon of moral virtue, and he's just that much better. But I see someone who was unjustly invaded. I'm going on their side. I see Anaheim Electronics selling to multiple sides in the midst of a conflict where we have the Titans, we have the AUG, we have Neo Zeon rising up as well. I get a little angry with that because all the mobile suits. Yes. That's it. Yeah. If you they, want a mobile suit, you go to Anaheim, they make it. Doesn't matter what side you're on. They're the only ones building the machines of death that everyone is using. And they are getting rich. Hmm. And, and there's something to say about what is more important, uh, business or human lives. And unfortunately, right. along the way, a lot of people will say, well, I'm making the money. What happens with it after the fact that's on them, not me? Mm-hmm. And that is very hollow to me ringing in my ears hearing someone say that but someone's going to be doing it 
So why shouldn't it be me or why shouldn't it be them? Like, I mean, yes. if I have were in charge, considered... thank God I'm not in charge. <laughs> have you yeah. considered yeah. that we would be making much more money than you? Yeah, it, it it's why I'm glad I'm never, ever, ever seeking any role in a political organization at all, because I know, number one, I'd never get elected because of the stances I take on things. And two, I don't want that responsibility. Now, mm -hmm. it's easier to armchair philosophize on all this and say, this is how you should be doing things. But to actually be the one to say, hey, like in my convictions, the fact that there is child slavery in the world or there is you know, human trafficking at all, that means I'm invading all those countries. I'm releasing them, freeing them. I don't care about international law. That is me, what I want to do. Now, that is not a very practical thing to do. That's not a very smart thing to do, but it's a very moral thing to do. Right. So it's all these things. So. I can't answer these questions that I presented fully. Like, obviously, I'm going to take a more hardline stance uh, on Anaheim Electronics and what they do in Gundam because I'd be a little harsher on someone who doesn't actually exist. It's a little easier <laughs> to make that argument, or to you know the corporations we have in Witch for Mercury that are uh, going all these things, uh, skirting the rules. It's not a Gundam because it doesn't have this in it, but we're still trying to sell you products <laughs> for a war we know is going to break out eventually along the way. So why don't we just get on top? Someone's going to do it, so we have to be the ones to research it. We're doing the things that's right here. It's them. They're the ones who are you know, uh, escalating conflicts on Earth and all this. Yeah. So there's that. You know. Something we could easily do a whole episode on, but I, I wanted to bring it up because it is a facet of Gundam as a whole. What else do you guys have to say? Uh, just which from Mercury sounds like the most American Gundam. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. I need to watch it. it it's well worth your time. Uh, you'll We're get my ratings in a little bit. Waiting for the next part of Hathaway. Oh, yes. Uh, have two been released or just one? Just one, at least that's what's on Netflix. That's right. Okay. Yeah, Hathaway's Flash, I'm looking forward to more of that because that gets into a deep, especially uh, with his relation to certain other Gundam characters and how he ends <laughs> up on other sides. Yeah. Uh, it's not going to be a pretty picture, I'll put it that way. No, not at all. And, and yeah, speaking of not pretty pictures, another big facet of this franchise are child soldiers. Mm -hmm. It's brought up multiple times over in this series as pretty much the vast majority of our protagonists end up being 17 or younger. I think we might've had like uh, what double O would kind of be an outlier in some respects. Cause I think they're a little older, some of them. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part, our youngest that I remember is Uso for victory being 13. Yeah. In the midst of a war, 50 plus episodes. Oh, actually I think it's 49 and having to be involved with killing people. Like, what do you believe? the varied Gundam series are saying about this real world problem and what are our thoughts on its execution within the franchise? Well, I, it seems like um, we should be giving our children guns is what Gundam wants us to do. <laughs> or not wants us to do, which is why it's so prevalent in, in the uh, storyline. Yeah. Well, keep in no. mind, you know, that's probably... Um, like Zeta feels darker because of the art style. And like the grittiness of the characters, but in actuality, the truly darkest show is Victory, and it has the youngest protagonist. Because um, like, not only is he a child soldier, but he is a child soldier protecting other children. Mm -hmm. so you have him and his friend, who found a little baby, and you've literally got babies raising babies, and then he. And then he, you know, he's flying the Gundam to protect this little child that they just found. Um, you know, it's horrifying to us, but, like, it, and I'm not saying this is any kind of justification, it's just reality. Um, like, throughout history, child soldiers were normal. If if you were like if you were old enough to bear arms, you fought for your family and your country and your land or you know your last cow or whatever it is that you're fighting for. Um, as soon as you're old enough to bear that arm, it's your responsibility to take up arms. So we're back to the same question. 
is it correct to take up arms at all? If it is, then why is it okay for adults to take up arms and not children? Should mm. If war is just and fighting is just and we want to teach our children to be moral and just, then why is it wrong for them to be involved in the fighting? I, I'm playing devil's advocate here. I'm throwing that out. But <laughs> like, if war is just and we want to have children who are just, then why not have children fight? Uh, I already said we should. <laughs> but ah, the always the maverick. It, it, let's remember who our target audience is. The original target audience, I'm not talking about the otaku and the weeaboos and the like who enjoy this far older than before. This is primarily targeted at children, younger teens, mostly boys. Right. And typically speaking in those series, who do you want as your protagonist? Someone closer to me in age. Right. So that's why it keeps happening time and time again. Amuro was what, like 16, 17 in Mobile yeah. Gundam? It was 15 13. when it started, I think, and then by the end of the war, he's 16. There you go. So you want someone you can relate with, especially when your target audience is that age. So, oh, who's easiest? That person my age. What would I do in those circumstances? Uh, as you know, someone... If I were going after that audience, I would probably do the same thing. I wouldn't have, you know, a 33 balding man like myself as the protagonist for a series geared towards, you know, 12 year olds. You know, right. maybe they enjoy it. Maybe they don't. But statistically speaking, they're probably going to enjoy someone like that. Right. Now, yeah. as, as far as what the series as a whole is saying, it's like it, war is hell is the main theme of Gundam. Regardless of what franchise you get into, no matter how war, very little doesn't uh, directly affect the events of things that are going on. War is hell. And because of that, bad things happen. Because of that, people are forced into impossible situations. The entire white base in Mobile Suit Gundam, and uh, was it the Archangel and Seed? I have to look it up again. Because Seed is kind of a pseudo remake of the original it, yeah. it branches off thank god as time goes on becomes its own man and then destiny happens and that's another issue but as things happen there you get hey these are kids being forced in a situation because of the actions of adults what do we do with that oh well that's what i have to do as a child anyways this is just a more fantastical presentation of that so what is it saying this shouldn't be happening and we're going to show you why this shouldn't be happening. We're going to yeah. have uh, we're going to have Camille at the end of the series. Uh, essentially, uh, respect for those who would be a little more sensitive about this topic. He is essentially mind raped at the end of the series and catatonic. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank God, something happens a long way for Double Zeta to improve some things. But still, uh, this shouldn't be happening. Uso in Victory Gundam has to murder multiple people. Some of them not even in mobile suits, in order for him to survive. This shouldn't be happening. But it is, how does our character progress from that? I think they're trying to say it's hard to fit an adult in the Gundam suit. It's a lot bigger. Ah, oh, you contrarian. You guys have anything else you want to say on this? I'm just trying to remember. I've... I've seen victory exactly once. So I'm just, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, generally it's true. The protagonist is meant to be the, you know, vessel through which the viewer um, can be part of, be part of the story. Um, they're the link. Um, and yeah, so I mean, uh, Victory, I don't know how much you know about it, but Victory was kind of a middle finger from Tamino <laughs> to yep. Sunrise. Because uh, like, he, he was he, he was done, actually, with Gundam stuff. Um, or, well, he'd made Zeta and then double Zeta, and then they're like, hey, you need to make something that's more for children. 
So he makes the he did that by having a young protagonist and then proceeding to make the Gundam show where the most amount of people die. <laughs> yes. It, it, this was his he was trying to torch the franchise mm -hmm. as much as he could make no one else interested in was this was another one of his massive depressive episodes not helped by the people at sunrise making decisions behind his back uh changing the structure of how those episodes happened because they aired the original four out of sequence yep uh because they wanted to get they, to the gundam as soon as possible yep they wanted the gundam in the first episode you know for merchandising reasons because they gotta <laughs> make that that moolah right and then FF91 and Victory both failed from a merchandising perspective. Yes. Anyway, and, so take that, yeah, Sunrise. And, oh, oh, this actually also reminded me of War in the Pocket, 0080. Ah. Where <laughs> uh, we get, Oof. oh gosh, uh, what is his name? Starts with an A. Uh, Albert? No. It's right? Alfred, isn't it? Uh, Alfred, yes, Alfred. Mm -hmm. Al, as yeah. he's referred to in the show a couple times. Yep. And you see him become best friends with a Xeon pilot who is, oh no, the Federation's doing exactly what they did in the first Gundam and making mobile suits they shouldn't be because it you know, disagrees with the treaties they've made on a mission that is not sanctioned officially, but something that they would be doing anyways to prevent the Federation from making another Gundam when he's also best friends with the pilot of that Gundam who is actually a military trained woman. And in the process, the two, uh, Bernie and Christina, uh, the Xeon pilot and the Federation Gundam pilot start falling in love with one another, end up in the process killing one another. Because they don't know and who you the have, other person is. Yeah. And you have yeah. Al as his, his friends who are the same age as him. He's about 10, 11. I think he's still in grade school. Love war. They love mobile suits. They're super into yes. all of that. And he literally watches his two best friends kill each other. And there's like, man, I hope there's another war that happens. I want to be a mobile suit pilot. And it, it gets to that whole, like, war is hell. You shouldn't want this. But he can't explain it because they haven't understood the things that he's experienced. And I think, mm -hmm. honestly, that's the best Gundam has ever been in the war is hell kind of mantra. In the yeah, very war in short. the pocket is fantastic. Yes. It, it and was it, the in first, a very short amount of time. It well, was the first. Um, it, it was the first OVA. It was the first Gundam piece not made by Tamino, but it is fantastic. Yes. It, it actually shows you why these conflicts are bad versus like, hey, like, oh, wow, cool robot. It, it's kind of like what people will say for people who just kind of watch Gundam and don't care about the politics. They say, like, oh, the mobile suits look cool. It's kind of the derogatory term people throw away at them. This the, the kids are those people. They don't get it because they see these really cool looking mobile suits, you know, in action. It's like, yeah, as a kid, I, that's one of the reasons why I watched it because it looked cool. And yeah. now as an adult, I can, I can see, yeah, this is cool, but I also appreciate the deeper themes behind this. But it's hard to explain that to someone who's never experienced that loss. Mm -hmm. Or is it? Is it is it F ninety one where they're fighting in a colony and and the spent shells are falling out of the gun and the casings by are the like people crushing. protecting them right 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 and, and and the empty casings are falling on people killing Ooh. them crushing children while they're protecting them yes yeah some people argue that's a little too much but I. I knew what they were going for there. I'm F fine with it. F91 would have been great if if he had been allowed to make it a show. Yes. Um, so we so gotten, that we would have gotten Crossbone and all of that, which is awesome. Oh man, I want Crossbone to be animated so bad. <laughs> so, you guys have anything else you want to add to this discussion before we start wrapping things up? No, I just think it. Uh, uh, you know, um, being lower the draft certain... age. <laughs> God almighty Got to him <laughs> TJ um, Being uh, You know Being someone who was initially sucked in uh, By wing Like pretty much anyone in the west Or at least in America um, But then, then getting into UC And really um, Like Gundams are cool um, And all that But it has it has quickly become about everything we've discussed today, and it is my 
Um, like maybe, maybe outside of Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Mm. Outside of that, I think that it just because those are maybe just because that's live action. Um, but I think that and then the Gundam franchise are like the two best War as Hell franchises. Um, uh, like if someone wants to understand. War bad. Like, Gundam is a great place to start. And you get to see cool robot fights while you're at it. Oh, yes. Yeah. All right. If, if Fallout wasn't so fun, it would be Fallout. <laughs> I think Fallout delivers the message. Which, well, it's just too fun to play. Fair. Speaking of, Fallout will be a part of our primarily political series as time goes on. So look forward to that. All right. So... As far as things go here, rating and reviewing, like it's kind of difficult to do for an entire franchise. Like, what do you guys think? Like, overall, what would you give Gundam? And I will give my ratings for everything I've watched. I'll just go through them and I can chime in on the ones I've seen. I know I haven't seen what you have, but I've probably seen more than TJ. Definitely. I'm probably probably in between somewhere. Um uh, man, I think Gundam as a whole, it's hard. You like you almost have to you almost have to rate UC and then rate everything else. Because um like UC as a whole, just in the continuity, at least if we're doing if we do one year war through unicorn. Right, because F like F ninety one and Victory were both Tamino. Well, actually he really liked F ninety one. Sunrise didn't. Um and then yeah. so victory and then so victory he torch those are bad on purpose. One one ruined by sun one ruined by sunrise, the other ruined by the author. But um so if we just look at the story of the one year war through unicorn, man, uh, you know, other than I think the new type stuff gets a little bit ridiculous by the end. Um, so that probably knocks it down to an 8.5 for me, okay. UC. Um, and then, um, you know, the other stuff is much more just fighting robots, which, you know, that's fun too. But, um, those, all other Gundam shows are probably a seven just cause they don't have the world building and the continuity, which are two things that I'm really into. DJ. Uh, I've seen Wing, Wing V, and Iron Blooded Orphans, so none. Okay, nine. yeah, uh, excellent. I'm gonna get the franchise as a whole a nine. If these numbers I give don't match up, don't worry, it's my math, not your math. So <laughs> don't at me. Uh, Devil Zeta, After War Gundam X, Turn A, tens, masterpieces all. Uh, Witch IBO, nine point five. Wing. Unicorn, nine. Uh, the eighth mobile suit team, uh, double O and narrative, 8.5. War in the Pocket, F91, G, The Origin, and Hathaway, eight. The original mobile suit Gundam and Gundam Age, 7.5. Thunderbolt, Seed, seven. Stardust Memory, six. Zeta and Victory, probably my most controversial picks here, four. Uh, Reconquista and G, and Seed Destiny 3, and I think 3 is a little too generous for me for Seed Destiny, but I was being nice. So, <laughs> does that end up as a 9 overall for the franchise? Probably not, because I know no, how numbers work. Not even but close. <laughs> that's what I'm going to say. <laughs> Man, I get, like, I get, I get putting Victory in a 4, but I just, Zeta. <laughs> hey, man. That's why we rate things differently. That's why we have these different scales. We're going to look at yeah. the same product. And have different opinions on it. That's a fun fact Absolutely. about that. Yeah. As much as you know, Joshua still loves the Last Jedi, and TJ loves it a little more than me. And I have to beg forgiveness for God before I take communion for my hatred in my heart towards them. You know, it's just how it is. People Those like different things. Don't exist for me. <laughs> I love I love all eight uh, Star Wars movies. <laughs> All right, before we get into that discussion again, and that's my fault for bringing it up, uh, as we're wrapping up, guys, what real-life politician do you think would enjoy your favorite movie? Well, first, I have to pick a favorite movie. <laughs> <laughs> and my, I'll go ahead and give you time to think, because my answer, I, 
might be a joke answer. Uh, I, I'm thinking my, you know, my favorite movie of all time is Return of the Jedi. Can come to it every single time. I know there's stuff that's messed up in it. It shouldn't be like if I'm looking at it objectively, it's not a ten out of ten. But it is to me for what it means, for what it represents, for hope and franchise and all that. I think, given that he made an entire program around it, it would probably be Reagan. <laughs> now yeah. I can't prove that. I, you know, I'm Reagan, and I sometimes agree, sometimes we don't. But I think he would enjoy Return of the Jedi, where he's still around. Mm. What was the exact question again? Which Real politician? Life politician would... Okay, so would not, enjoy your favorite like... movie. Okay, I think Andrew Yang would like Treasure Planet a lot. Okay. Treasure Planet, excellent choice. I don't know that I can answer that. <laughs> That's fair. The answer is, I don't know. I don't know is an answer. That's yeah. something people need to be able to say more often. <laughs> so I won't cut you down for that. So moving on from there, guys, you have a recommendation for the audience to check out. Doesn't have to be about uh, mobile suits or anime or anything that we've talked about today. Could be anything in general. Watch Starship Troopers. Hell Divers Two is getting really big, and it's based on Starship Troopers loosely. Has a lot of the same themes. Fantastic game, fantastic movie. Okay, Matthew. Oh, uh, let's say completely unrelated to uh, any of these topics. Uh, something, um, you know, I scoffed at for a long, long time, thought it was nonsense and whatever, but it it has been changing my life, changing my headspace for sure, and just making me a better person all around. If you don't already, I recommend practicing silence. It can be two minutes, it can be five, but just find a place and a time to just be quiet. All right. Yeah, that's the great thing about recommendations. They don't have to be about anything we've discussed. They could, they can't. It's whatever is on your mind. That's a great one, too. Like, silence. I'm not good at silence. I get very antsy. I, I can't do it. At times, but it's good every now and then to shut everything off, get away, and just think. Or not even think sometimes, just get away. Yeah, just so, quiet your head too, just complete silence. Uh, my actual recommendation would be Fang of the Sun Dogram, one of my favorite mecha shows uh, from that 70s, 80s period. It, uh, if, you wanna, if you want an anime that gives you mecha action, but also actually cares about logistics and economics and how that would affect a war or civil war. Dogram's the way to go. Like it's got some great characters in it. It's got some great action for its uh, giant robots, but it's more uh, real robot compared to super robot. It's a lot of fun. So guys, thank you for listening to today's episode. We really appreciate everything you guys are doing for us to continue to coming back here. It means the world to us. Uh, if Somewhere out there, so there's someone saying, that's what you rated, that specific Gundam series, Christian. I'm going to have a talk with you. I'm okay with that. Join us on Discord. <laughs> Join us on Facebook. I will listen to what you have to say, and we will have a fun argument over it. Uh, please, just if you get a chance to leave a five-star review in your podcasting platform of choice. I'm going to shout out some patrons real quick in no specific order. Uh, Russell Gentry, Justin Vaughn, Annette Knoll, and Jeannie Mattingly. Thank you guys for helping keep the lights on. We really appreciate everything you do. But remember, we are all the chosen people. A geekdom of priests.